I recognize the Honourable the Member for uh, Pogo Island, Cape Friels. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour and a privilege to rise here today in this Honourable House and address the members of this caucus, members opposite, members of the third party, and all others watching. Although I've had the opportunity to stand before and read member statements, I find myself standing here today with a whirlwind of emotions. To be one of 40 who will help shape this province for the coming years is not to be underestimated. Mr. Speaker, looking back over the past 30 years until now, I muse as I think where one's life may lead them. I grew up in Greenspan, a small isolated community on the northeast coast. It was once known as the capital of Banavis and North. Being the largest island, we served the islands around the bay. Greenspan was founded in 1697 and boasted over 2,000 people in the early, early 1900s. Back then, we had the magistrate, a courthouse, a jail, a doctor, a nurse, probably one of the first banks of Montreal's, customs office, and a constable station. But in the 70s, when I grew up, things were different. Growing up on an isolated island, Ed has changed us. I had a little footnote there, not a lot of girls. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that or not. <laughs> <coughs> Greenspan had no running water in the winter months. Everyone used buckets in the sled. There was not one of us who couldn't carry two five-gallon buckets of water with a oop at least 500 meters without putting it down. It was usually a contest to bring water. We quickly learned to improvise. When you broke something, you soon figured out you couldn't just buy a part anywhere. You had to go somewhere and make a part. One time, half a dozen of us got together and built a car out of two 10-speed bikes and some old bid cigar and a skidoo motor. <laughs> it all went well until the two boys decided to turn different ways. Little did I know these early skills would come in our Andy later on. After finishing high school, I should note I had a brief stint at Mon. My brother Clyde and I spent a summer fishing, another summer in the fish plant, and then off to trade school with hopes to be a power engineer. I completed that, and no crystal ball could have pre predicted me here today. <laughs> I went into the workforce at a time when the baby boomers were in their prime, and jobs were hard to find. There were no mega projects in this province, and Alberta then was a world away. Power engineering would have to wait. Mr. Speaker, a job came up at the town office. And at 21 years old, I was offered the job of town clerk manager in the town of Greenspan. My then girlfriend was in nursing, so I decided to take the job until she finished. Then I was going to retire, a kip man. <laughs> but she said no, and 29 years later, I was still there. Mr. Speaker, don't think that for 29 years I limited myself to Greenspan and to then 500 people. I spent the first, two or first year or two advising the town council, trying to bring the then financially overburdened town out of the red. I, know, I will never forget it. My first week on the job, the town owed over $10,000 with not a cent in the bank. We had to get a grant from, as everybody called it then, the government to pay the light bill, the phone bill, and a few others. My first check with the town bounced. <laughs> there was no water and sewer in Greenspan at the time, so I toiled on, working away with every day being another step forward. Believe it or not, I loved my job, but we could not fully settle down until my girlfriend then and now wife Beverly found a job in nursing. She found a job at Brookville Hospital, so we built a family and a life in Greenspan. I love my job and I devoted my time to it. Now I should also note Greenspan had just been connected to the mainland by a causeway. People were flocking to see this tiny community. Most would think it's a good thing, but please remember the roads in Greenspan were little more than footpaths. My brother and I spent more time directing traffic and pulling people back on the road than anything else. We started water and sewer. To say Greenspan is a solid rock would not be an understatement. <laughs> Blasting with the vast majority of homes on wooden shores led to many calls to the office of my home. You could say it ticking my skin. <laughs> I became an on-site inspector. I became almost a master of all the little things at the time. 
town person, no lawyer for snow clearing. So my brother in Clyde, who was always by my side, I would think, I remember him calling me early one morning. The fuel pump was broke, and the snow was half a storm. So we rigged up a gas tank to the back of the loader. I sat up on the back, squeezing the ball while Clyde cleared the snow. <laughs> so now you can see where my story of building the bike paid off. <laughs> now, thanks to my parents, Stuart and Millie, they instilled in me the need to volunteer. I had dabbled into volunteer committees for a couple of years, but at 23 years old, I jumped in full time. I became the fire chief and chair of the recreation committee. It was a bit unnerving to chair a meeting with everyone else much older than me watching on. Then I got on board the Camomier Committee. We had just built a new regional stadium. I became part of the Center Loop and Recreation Committee. Basically there, I became the voice and face of the stadium, taking many off the blows from, from running that. I somehow fitted in marriage and found time, found time to raise a daughter. My, my wife, Beverly, would always say, Derek, please let somebody else do it this time. Why can't you just sit back and enjoy yourself? But I was always the one to be into it, up to my eyes, full speed ahead. Mr. Speaker, I truly enjoyed my job and the people I met while I was clerk manager of Greenspan. There was times when I put Greenspan on the map. <laughs> and you may not believe this, but there was a time I was too shy to say my name at a public gathering. Then I was encouraged to run for the Central Director of Provincial Municipal Administrators. They were in the Lama at the time. From there, I went on to be the Vice President and finally President of PMA. Being President gave me the opportunity to meet many administrators and councillors from across Newfoundland and Labrador. I got to represent our Municipal Administrators across Canada. I credit so much to PMA. It gave me the opportunity to listen to the problems and successes of other communities across the province. Our later, I later learned our problems are consistent across Canada. I remember going to my first interprovincial meeting it was in Victoria, BC. I walked in thinking, well, what can I bring to the table here? I walked out a couple of hours later but everybody wanted a copy of what we had accomplished here in this province, a copy of our core program that we had development, developed for the administrators. I can't lie, I had a smile on my face, my line. Somewhere in that time frame, I joined the local Cape Creole Development Association, assumed the position of director, vice president, and president. Here we tackled many local issues, from walking trails to sunnies, to building repairs, to child care centers, to the stadium repairs. Through it all, I had the urge to get into politics. I mentioned it to my family and friends many times, and I'll be honest, most called me nuts. Before my father and uncle passed away, I had many conversations with them. My father would say, you're all right, where you're to, my son. <laughs> he was always content with his lot in life. Now, my uncle Mike, he was a political junkie. He encouraged me. But I'm going to be honest to the members who haven't. I was even rather I was probably sitting over there. <laughs> <laughs> Our daughter, Allison, was still in school, and she was involved in every school sport and activity known. We spent more time on the road than we did home, and my political thoughts were put on the back burner. But through it all, my desire to get into politics got stronger. Many people encouraged me. Beverly and I had several discussions, and with her support, we agreed to meet Scott Sims and discuss for him to give me the insight to the world of politics. Scott gave me the short version of it. <laughs> Another year passed, and finally word was spreading about the upcoming election. I was not sure how to proceed. Then one night, my phone rang. Vera Barber was on the other end. <laughs> And everybody, I'm sure, on this side would know Vera Barber, and probably a lot of people on that side would know Vera Barber. I would, I mean, Vera's probably the guru for, our, for, for the Liberal Party, for sure, right? So she gave me the extra push. From there, Beverly Allison and I worked night and day for me to secure the nomination for Barnabas and North. Many people came forward to help me for that nomination, and after winning the nomination race, we looked forward to the anticipated election. 
But I guess I know where you, where you know where this story goes. Bonavista North sank into the larger district of Fogo Island, Cape Frios. Not only was Bonavista North in the new district, included Air Bay Dover to the west, uh, with line with Gander Bay North, Orwood, Port Albert, Stoneville, Change Islands, and Fogo Islands to the north. Once more, I faced a nomination race, and yes, I won that one too. <laughs> then it was figuring out how to run a campaign. And I had a note there, I'm sure everybody could write a book on running a campaign, because that was a challenge. Because there's a relatively, got, the area got so much bigger with so many new people, but at the end of the day, it was all worth it. I can't think enough the people who came forward to help. People that I didn't even know going into it came forward to help me. People gave freely after time. I would be forever grateful to these people who helped me win. My campaign team were superb. Most people have one campaign chair. I had three co-chairs. Today, I extend special thanks to my wife, Beverly, and our daughter, Allison, for their support. Without their support, none of this would have been possible. To the people of Fogo Island, Cape Frios, thank you for your support. Because without your faith in me, I would not be standing here today. But before I clue up, I would like to add, the name of our district, Fogo Island, Cape Frios, is really not representative of the district it represents. Depending on where you look at it, it either ends or begins in scenic area, airway, followed by the Dover's Fault. Then it's to center row where I'm trending in Indian Bay, where you'll find some of the best fishing ponds on the island. A sidebar out to historic Greens Pond, visit the Barber Living Village in New West Valley, walk the sandy beaches from Cape Frills, Lum, and Deadman's Bay down to Musgrave Harbor. A visit to Aspen Aledo Cove for a feed of lobsters. Carmen Cove, Fredericton, Carmen Cove, Navin Cove, and Fredericton, you will find shipwrecks and boat launches. Then it's on to Davidsville, Main Point, Gander Bay South, and Gander Bay North for some of the biggest salmon fishing grounds around. That's in shore, by the way. In Orwood, <laughs> Stoneville, and Port Albert, you will find that logging was once the way of life. And in Farewell, you will wait in line with the numerous visitors from all over who can't wait to see Change Islands with its fishing stages. And finally, or as I said, depending on where you come from, beginningly, you come to Fogo Island, where fishing is vibrant, punts are everywhere, and they boast of an exotic inn fit for the Prime Minister. <laughs> that, my fellow colleagues, is how I got here, and a little bit of district I plan to serve to the best of my ability. I can I hope this political life can be as rewarding to me as my past experience with my job and volunteer work. A lady once asked me, Derek, will you change politics or will politics change you? I'm guessing only time will tell. I'm anticipating a little of each. I look forward to serving this province and the people of Fogo Island, Cape Frios. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs>